In this video, I'm going to make a few comments about each of the six attributes which are attributable to Hawk. And Hawk is the first person of the Godhead. The six attributes are eternity, omniscience, omnipotence, unity, supreme reality, and perfection. Before I get into the six attributes though, there is one other feature of Hawk. Uh, you would almost maybe call it just Hawk's substance or another name for Hawk. And uh, it is difference. And difference goes along with names that the other two persons, Olalon and Light, have. So there's difference, which is Hawk, and then there's six attributes. And then Olalon is identity, and then Olalon has six attributes, and Light is actuality, and then Light has six attributes. So those three terms relate to each other in a very special way. They govern the, the perichoresis or the life of the Trinity. And um, so I'll say more about that probably when I get to the concept of perichoresis, which is uh, really far away from here in the calendar. But just for now, the basic idea of this difference is that like if Hawk is kind of, you know, God the Father or the kind of um, seemingly most primordial aspect of God, although in fact it's not most primordial, the, the three are co-equal, um, Hawk, Olalon, and Light. Um, insofar as Hawk is difference, just keep in mind the idea that for there to be anything at all, there has to be some kind of difference between something and something else. And that is the fundamental principle of difference that sort of uh, color, colors everything about this person of the Godhead. So Hawk is difference. So then the first proper attribute of Hawk is eternity. And the first thing you should think of in terms of eternity is the idea that God um, will always exist and always has existed. Um, so that's the sort of obvious meaning of eternity. That's kind of the Aristotelian meaning that if there's anything at all, uh, God is there also. Um, and that's what it means to be eternal from one point of view. The, um, the kind of value of this thought and the uh, uh, religious experience that goes with it is something that Spinoza describes really well in his um, spiritual autobiography, but you can have the insight that um, I shouldn't and don't need to place my attachment and sense of dependence upon anything in the world, because all of those things, um, at the very least, will ultimately pass away and I'll lose them. And it can get a lot worse because they're also likely to betray me um, or lead me into pain in other ways. But uh, at the very least bad, they're not eternal. But God is there and he is eternal. And so if I can attach my sense of dependence to God, to Hawk, um, that is, that's a really lovely thing that I can do. 
The second sense of God's eternity that I want to bring up here, I associate with Avicenna, who um, is another philosopher, Islamic philosopher, who redefined um, eternity as being related to um, the impossibility, like a logical impossibility of the opposite being true. So in other words, um, a square circle um, is necessary, uh, is, n is impossible rather, sorry. Uh, and so there being no square circles is an eternal truth um, because for there to be a square circle by definition is impossible. So God is eternal in the same way. Um, there must be a God. And if you see reality for what it is, you will discover that there's a God. So this aspect of eternity goes really nicely with the other aspect um, because you know, not only is it the case that God is something that I can deeply rely on emotionally, but um, if I see reality for what it is, I know that that thing that will always be there, uh, it's not just in my imagination, it's, it, it's real. Now, I won't go into how, like the, so the, the details or the path uh, involved in arriving at the conclusion that God must be, uh, God must be eternal, must be real. But I'll just, uh, you know, say that like that's the the idea is that if you honestly uh, approach the world from a philosophical standpoint, you will arrive at that conclusion. And at some point, I'll, I'll go through the steps. But this is something that, like, Plato did, for example. You know, this is a, this is a very ancient, time-tested move to make in philosophy. Though it's not as popular in contemporary and modern philosophy, um, but, uh, you know, so much the worse for contemporary and modern philosophy. Um... There's more I could say about eternity, and I've actually gone further into depth in uh, an earlier video, which I'll, I'll put the thing up for it. But I'm going to move on now to God's omnipotence. And speaking of modern or contemporary philosophy, uh, there's a great proof by Quentin Maysu about God's omnipotence, uh, which is worth checking out in uh, connection with the first point that I'll make about God's omnipotence, which is that God's activity obeys no law of any kind. And so that means that on the one hand, God does not obey the laws of nature, like the laws of physics and so forth. God, God is not in the universe, he suspends those laws. Um, but God also does not obey any law of computation or probability. So for a while, I was obsessed with um, Stephen Wolfram and Cellular Automata and Conway and the Game of Life. Uh, if for those of you who know that what that stuff is and it's very fascinating to think of there actually being um, a computational order of causality that is higher than the laws of physics um, in a way that's similar to the to how the code of a computer game uh, is higher than like the physics simulator in the game it's kind of like that um, and uh, you know now people talk about the simulation hypothesis and stuff. So anyway, that also, if that's true uh, of our world, 
that also is not God. Um, uh, God, God is beyond reason um, and is beyond prediction and analogy and space and time. Like, and um, so that's that's the claim that I'm making. And then uh, I'm not getting into it here, but Maisieu has a very interesting proof of that claim, which which I think is is correct. I think that he's right. So that's how powerful God is. And the existential value um, in grasping that um, is that we then know that the world could really change in accordance with a uh, just and appropriate human desire, right? So that, um, you know, that there are, are alternatives to capitalism and there are alternatives to um, all the darkness in the world. The world doesn't have to be the way that it is um, because God is beyond probability and causality and uh, and therefore the coming of the kingdom of heaven is neither improbable nor impro neither improbable nor probable. And so there then becomes a kind of responsibility to make contact with its possibility and try to make it a reality. Another meaning of the term omnipotence is simply that um, it's more traditional. It's just that God is um, the life force that's animating all things. And that there's some kind of correspondence between, you know, um, the you know, desire involved in sort of creating life and in, um, you know, creative work and scientific work and um, just sort of authentic actions. Like that there is a kind of, um, life to things that one can tap into and make contact with and that it has this mark of um, being without analogy or without comparison like it's there's this newness um, so that's another sense of uh, God's omnipotence we turn to God's omniscience now. One aspect here is that God's knowledge is uh, on an order that is higher than anything that I am or we are capable of. And there, there's no way for us to really grasp everything or grasp God, or grasp God's will. Um, this is a very traditional view of God's omnipotence, on omniscience rather. When, you know, a twist that I would give it is that, you know, human human cognition is evolving, and so it's not clear to me that the human mind could never understand everything God knows or understand God. Um, but at least at the current cognitive horizon, that's not possible. And the existential meaning of that is that there's no point in trying to figure everything out, nor in trying to bend the world to my will, because I don't know that what I want is going to create the outcome that I think it will for me. And that outcome may not make me feel the way that I think it will, even if it does come to pass. Another sense of God's omniscience is a little more approachable. Um, it's the notion that is also very ancient, even more ancient, but has sort of a modern twist, uh, that all of the forms of reality are in God's mind. So like God kind of, God's mind contains these kind of spectral records of everything that has ever happened. Um, and as humans 
create new things and new ideas and new theories. Um, and as species is evolve and that kind of thing, these things are all kind of contained in God's mind. And what we can do is, um, it's kind of this imperative to learn in a way, you know, it's that like, um, what a human can do is make contact with one of those forms in God's mind. And then by, by um, experimenting with it in a new context, that form can kind of evolve. So it's really a thesis about the existence of the world of forms in Plato's sense of the term um, and their nature and their, their temporality, which is something that Plato was not able to think, but, but Hegel was more able to. Um, so, yeah, the thought there is that um, it's kind of like a lay down your buckets where you are kind of imperative, you know, that like, well, I'm sort of thrown into this world with these forms and I can't really start anything from scratch, but I can try to deeply penetrate that which is around me and try to pierce through the simulacra um, that that those forms are sort of leaving in the more ordinary world and find 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 them where they really are. And um, so yeah, more can be said about what is the nature of these forms that are in God's mind and uh, how they evolve. God's unity is a principle of living harmony that arises out of elements that are otherwise disconnected from one another. And this is the point at which perhaps Hawk touches Heil, uh, the, 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 the principle of nothingness that I discussed, because like, it's like before God or outside of God somehow, there is a field of completely disconnected elements. And then God um, somehow creates a unity out of a certain amount of those um, and when that happens, there's some kind of um, harmonizing field that 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 takes place um, that is that is good, that is vivid, um, that is authentic and unique and loving. And the existential meaning here is kind of the idea of, humans having a responsibility to um, a certain community or institution, like something like a church, either a literal church or a different kind of community, where like, um, where like you're not always glad to be showing up, but you, you do show up and then this 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 communal life sort of emanates from that. I think you get the basic idea of what I'm talking about. It sounds fairly banal, um, and in a way it, it is, um, but to, to understand that that's an attribute of God sort of helps with maybe underscoring just how, just how precious it is. Supreme reality might sound a little banal too when I describe it, so what, what I have in mind is the way that um, certain works of art or actions um, are unmistakably uh, authentic and real um, in a way that like changes, changes the way that you perceive. You know, it's like there are certain works of art that they hit you like a lightning bolt. And from then on, you sort of perceive the world differently. Maybe you make your own work differently. And usually these works, then people start writing about them or responding to them or imitating them. Um, 
but there, there is some kind of principle uh, of like that around which simulacra begin to cluster. Um, and it's that realness uh, that I have in mind here. So whenever that happens, um, whether it's in a religious domain or an artistic or a scientific domain or a moral one, God is there. But God is also the, like the, the like God, God is that, you know, at, at, at the highest level. So God, God is the highest ratio of reality to imitation of anything that there is. Finally, we arrive at God's perfection, which is a tragic thing, actually. It sounds pretty good, but perfection is the fly in the ointment of the Godhead. Um, there are many proofs in different domains, um, especially different fields of mathematics, that um, that perfection, so perfection meaning that every, like the God is, that there is no nothingness in God, essentially. Um, that of all possible, like, parameters, God satisfies all of them, right? God, God is absolutely perfect, lacking in nothing. Um, but then it can be like, well, so I, I won't get into it, but I'll just mention Russell's paradox as a version of what makes this impossible. But the point here is that there's something logically impossible um, about this, th this perfection, because um, there's just something missing from something that is everything you know if if something is lacking nothing then it's lacking nothing um and again that might sound banal there are ways to dress it up to make it sound less banal but this this is the key moment of um of uh anguish within god in in my opera and origin of the alimonies and this is the transitional moment from Hawk to Olalon. So in the way that I'm um, uh, presenting it here, this lacking nothing is the passage from Hawk to Olalon. Um, and in my opera, it sort of appears in a different mode uh, as Olalon realizes that she's lacking nothing and that causes her to give birth to Sem who is Sem is not part of the Godhead at all Sem is is, is man um, fallen man and um, so anyway that's perfection that's God's perfection and with that I have uh, gone through all six of the attributes of Hawk.